I'm Michael Carey, the pastor of Church in the Wild. If I had to pick a word for this new year so far, that word would be stormy. I think you know what I mean, stormy. And it's really good that we come to this place in Mark's gospel. You see, just after Jesus sent his disciples on personal mission trips, after they came back and reported all that they were able to see and do, after Jesus involved the disciples in feeding the 5,000, we are told in chapter 6, verse 45, that immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Now, first of all, let's notice the rhythm of discipleship, even for Jesus himself, how he modeled it. After a season of ministry, Jesus goes by himself to pray, goes up on a mountainside. Jesus, um, after involving his disciples in mission, he, he sent them to voyage back to a town which was sort of a home base, and he sent them without him in his immediate presence. Now, this pattern of being with the disciples and then being away from the disciples is repeated frequently in the Gospels. It's part of the method of the way that Jesus taught them how to be disciples and how to teach other people to be disciples. He was, of course, intimately with them as a friend as he made the journey with them. He taught them around the campfire. And yet he also would step away from them or send them out. And we read more of this and the impact in verse 47. So remember, they are away from him. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Now, this wasn't a time to minister in his name. It was a time to be without him in a more vulnerable situation. We have to remember that back then, boats were like handmade canoes. Few, few of the disciples would know how to swim. They really didn't have life preservers. But, and most important, the weather was, uh, could be very tricky. The, the, the region is known for sudden windstorms, sudden gales that could reach 30, 40 miles an hour. And that meant to go across that freshwater lake, five miles across, put them in a vulnerable situation. Jesus knew this, and I think he knew what was coming. And he saw this as an opportunity to help them grow as disciples. I would make the analogy of raising children. Children need to experience vulnerability of, of mom, mommy and daddy kind of stepping back and letting the child experiment with being alone. Children, as they grow up, need the experience of responding to potential dangers um, under the watchful eye of mom and dad. Uh, an example of this, my parents taught me at an early age how to use boats. That's one reason I love boats so much as an adult. <laughs> and I remember that I would be able to take the boat out, um, paddling the canoe or using a sailboat or a motorboat at a pretty young age. Of course, I was always reminded of the rules of safety, and I think my parents kind of kept a watchful eye on the situation. But one time, I went out and got way out in the middle of a big lake, and the wind came up, and it came up, you know, where it was in, the, in my face as I was trying to paddle back to where I'd started. And I couldn't do it. The wind was too great. It, the waves were starting to really get large, and so my friend and I just did our best to kind of move the boat where we, where we um, ran up against a shore. And we got out of the canoe and we had to walk the canoe through shallow water all the way around till we got to where we'd started. Now we learned the hard way not to do that again and to watch the changes in the weather. And I think that's the way we grow spiritually. Jesus sends us out into mission. He doesn't want us just to study the Bible and, and, and comfort in the security of our churches. He wants to send us out 
in mission and in life, he's, he lets us go out into vulnerable situations. He has ascended into heaven, so he is physically absent from us as disciples. He doesn't guarantee us comfort or safety or success. He allows us to struggle. And I think that verse 48 kind of sums up our situation sometimes. Verse 48 said, Jesus saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Man, does that phrase not capture the way many of us feel right now? It feels this way for me, straining at the oars, the wind against me. How does it feel for you sometimes? Straining at the oars, the wind against you, perhaps COVID fatigue, perhaps fighting depression because of COVID, frustration over our nation's divisions, discouragement over the decline of Christian witness, disappointment with fellow church members or what you see in the church at large, fearful of economic hardship, you're doing your best to save your business, to make to be a to be effective and, and successful and yet it feels like you're straining against the wind or perhaps in your own personal circumstances trying to overcome a compulsion an addiction challenges in your marriage challenges in your family straining at the oars because the wind is against you the good news is that Jesus is watching that Jesus shows up and that Jesus rescues. The Bible tells us he saw his disciples and I believe he sees us. Verse 48 goes on to tell us that shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because he saw, they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. So in this case, we see that Jesus walked on water to get to them. That was supernatural, I think it's safe to say. We who are his disciples thousands of years later, we experience his presence because he comes to us supernaturally. The Father has raised Jesus from the dead. The Holy Spirit has been sent to dwell in our hearts that we might experience the powerful presence of Jesus in our lives. Jesus assures us as his disciples that he is with us. He, he gets in our boat, so to speak. Now, he doesn't always calm the storm around us. That part's different from this story. And yet his powerful presence can calm us as we heed his presence and as we trust him. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians about the peace that passes all understanding, that that peace can fill our hearts and our minds. Now, this story ends with the disciples being amazed that Jesus stills the storm. It, 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 it says editorially, Mark says, that they still didn't understand the fullness of his power. Uh, they still didn't understand, you know, that he could do uh, supernatural things and that he could feed the 5,000, that he could multiply the loaves. I think most of us understand that who... Jesus is the Lord of all, that he can do mighty things. I think what we don't understand is why Jesus doesn't still the storms around us. Why does Jesus allow the storms to rage? Why do we have so much to endure? Why are we having to row against the wind? And I think the best explanation is found in the cross. The cross of Christ, the center of our faith, it reminds us, that the, that the Father sent the Son to embody suffering love. And Jesus 
in dying on the cross didn't force his will on people. And even after being raised from the dead, in this time period we're in now, Jesus doesn't force his will on people. Jesus will not bring his will completely to pass until he comes again. And that's when all will be made right. But until then, Jesus does not force his way. And he does not want his disciples to try to force his will on other people. And I think we got to get that in our heads. He does not want us to force his will. He calms our hearts and he enables us to impact the world by embodying his suffering love, by showing sacrificial love for those around us. That sacrificial love for people around us, even when they don't deserve it, that's what opens hearts and minds. That's what brings the reign of God to the world in more visible ways until Jesus returns to complete what he started. And so to be centered within, to be able to be centered in Jesus so that we can be calm and manifest his love to others, that's the kind of kingdom influence we aspire to have. And so I urge you, I urge you to work on your rhythms of, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. In this new year, to strive to be a more disciplined disciple. <laughs> That's where the word discipline comes from, is the word disciple. And so, and so carve out time, make time every morning for, for prayer, to be with the Lord alone. Find a way, if you don't have a mountain nearby to climb, to, to be alone and to be focused and to pray. And I invite you also to end your prayer something like the way that I've learned to end my prayer in the morning. And that is praying something of what I call a missional disciples prayer. It goes like this. Lord, open my eyes to what opens, excuse me, open my eyes to what you see. Break my heart for what breaks your heart. Show me what you're doing and show me how to join you in your work on earth. And then when I see that, Lord, help me not to duck. <laughs> and when it seems that you are straining at the oars because the wind is in your face, trust Jesus, for he will show up.